Werewolves! Ow! Oh, sorry. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, aren't I? Well, thankfully for us, there is a lot to sink our teeth into here. Excuse the pun. Given the wanton folklore machinations of lycanthropes and the wolfmen of the wild that have long darted through the thicket in this wonderful tapestry of mythology and history. Believe it or not, but whilst werewolves are often underpinned as a hallmark of medieval Europe and the fears that descended during the Dark Ages, lycanthropes of ancient history date back to the dawn of human civilization. So, what is the truth behind it? Why are we humans so fascinated with the mysterious figure who succumbs in time? to the wild, giving themselves to the primal urges of the wolf. Let's find out. Hello horror fans, what's going on? And once again, welcome back to the Scary Channel on YouTube Top 5 Scary Videos. As per usual, I'll be your horror host Jack Fincher. Today, in this latest episode of The Law Explored, we rear our bloodthirsty moors skyward and take a look at the werewolf. Roll the clip. For the curious amongst you, that clip was from 2010's The Wolfman, starring Benicio Del Toro as one particular wolfman with a few daddy issues, illustrating the archetypal mysticism and many taboos that evidently come with being a lycanthrope, particularly if you're a 19th century aristocrat in Victorian London. And as some of you may know, The Wolfman is a near direct remake of 1941's The Wolfman, starring Lon Chaney Jr. as the titular beast man in question, which is widely considered to be the most recognisable and most cherished original version of the werewolf myth ever created on film. And whilst it certainly wasn't the first, it's one of the best, and it gave popular rise to what we now consider to be werewolf horror cinema, cementing other actors such as the legendary Paul Nashe, Henry Hull, Oliver Reed, Jack Nicholson and David Norton in their iconic lycanthropic roles. But first, before we give credit to the hallmarks of horror cinema that the image of the werewolf has become, let's first begin where all things should. Etymology. After all, what's in a word? As you may imagine, the word werewolf comes from the Old English compound of were meaning man and wolf meaning, well, wolf. Now, although this is certainly the clearest definitive origin of the term, there are other far older origins of similar sorts of terms. Low Latin describes the Gerulfus, which the French later misheard as Garavu, which means beware, harking back to their description of the iconic Lou Garou, a wolf to be aware of. But it's older than that still, and although the Norman Frankish described the Varuwulf, Old Norse describes the Varufa, or in much rarer terms the Ulfhedin, one in wolfskin. In modern Scandinavian there is even the Kveldulf, the evening wolf, considered to be derived from the name of the legendary Kveldulf Bjalfason, a historical Norse berserker from the 9th century. However, the actual term lycanthropy comes from an ancient Greek term as a compound of leukos meaning wolf and anthropos meaning human. Although the term doesn't appear until late antiquity, it is derived from a far more ancient one, therianthropy, the mythological act of metamorphosis and shape-shifting from a human to an animal that is as old as ancient Egyptian mythology, appearing in the mythos of myriad African and Eurasian cultures and folklore from ancient Mesoamerica to the Kingdom of China. As it seems, the act of transforming from a human being to a primal creature has played an integral part in the methods of our ancient oral and recorded traditions. And here is where things get interesting, because although the origins of the term werewolf are ancient indeed, the archetypal European concept of the werewolf emerges from a very clear source, that being the ferociously feared warrior classes of the ancient Germanic tribes, many of whom revered the wolf as a potent symbol of both hunter and fighter. You see, the transformation from men into wolves was a wide-held belief throughout Iron Age Europe, particularly in the Germanic sphere, often highlighted in their belief of Tierkrieger, also known as Woden or Odin in Norse, the leader of the wild hunt himself. Interestingly enough, it has also been noted that the metaphorical image of the widespread belief of wolf men in ancient Europe and the wider Indo-European sphere is directly correlated to the tribal transition of Europeans moving from fruit gathering to predatory hunting during the Iron Age, a forgotten cultural practice that was revered by ancient pagan European society. In 440 BC, the ancient Greek historian Herodotus in his histories described the Nuri, a tribe which he played in the northeast of Scythia, where all of its members transformed into wolves once every year for several days, where they roamed the wild before changing back to their human forms. Now, in all likelihood, this was a tribe that is now part of Russia, and the tribespeople of the Nuri were most certainly using wolf skins and pelts for warmth during winter, but still, the metaphor is what's important here. Similarly, in the second century BC, the Greek geographer Pausnasius described the story of Lycaon, the king of Arcadia, who was transformed into a 
Beowulf following his ritualistic murder of a child. Lycaon's transformation was bestowed upon by Zeus after his attempt to serve him human flesh to discover if he truly was a god, depicting cannibalism and murder as a grave taboo, and the result being this primal, torturous prison. As written by Ovid in his Metamorphosis, describing the transformation of King Lycaon, he tried to speak, but his voice broke into an echoing howl. His ravening soul infected his jaws, his murderous longings were turned on the cattle, he still was possessed by bloodlust. His garments were changed to a shaggy coat, and his arms into legs. He was now transformed into a wolf. However, although numerous are these references to man transforming to wolf in ancient literature, it is older than even that. You see, the first ever allusion to a man transforming into a wolf astoundingly dates back to the oldest surviving great work of literature in human history, the Epic of Gilgamesh, dating back to the third dynasty of Ur, roughly around 2100 BC. Lycanthropy, as it seems, is a tale as old as time. But why? What is it of these monsters to men? What is this morbid fascination that many of our cultures have held with the act of this primalistic transformation? Inexplicably, as ancient history is often suggested, Suggested, it occurred with the debasement of the human moral spirit, succumbing to the bloodthirsty primal urges of a violent act, murder, cannibalism, the sight of a frightful massacre, not in any sense of the martial or the art of war, because as we know the ancient world certainly enjoyed a battle or two, but in the actions outside of what was considered moralistically sound of the time. And perhaps here is where the werewolf tale begins to take on its far more human sensibility. You see, the werewolf is a bizarre construct. It comes from a cultural function of damning violent and bloodthirsty actions, but as Europe wrestled itself from the grip of the Roman Empire, the cultural myth of the werewolf seemed to expand into the role of almost a guardian of sorts, albeit one that was primed for feasting on human flesh. You see, the Germanic pagan traditions that we previously spoke of persisted longest throughout the Scandinavian Viking Age. King Harold Fairhair of Norway was said to have commanded his troop of Ulfhidna, often mentioned throughout the Volsunga saga, fearsome berserkers who wore the skins of wolves to channel the spirits of these ferocious animals to enhance their effectiveness in battle. This was continued in the traditional period of the Kievian Rus, a loose confederation of Slavic and Finnic peoples of Europe throughout the 9th to the mid 13th century, which would form the legendary Slavic mythology of the werewolf, one that is far, far different from the medieval depiction of the lycan. Historically speaking, the legendary 11th century Belarusian prince Vleslav of Polotsk was very openly considered to have been a werewolf, reportedly capable of moving at superhuman speeds and proudly documented in the 12th century text, The Tale of Igor's Campaign. Here it was stated that Veslav the prince judged men. As prince he ruled towns, but at night he prowled in the guise of a wolf. From Kiev prowling, he reached before the cock's crew, Tumtakaran, the path of great sun. As a wolf prowling, he crossed. For him, in Polotsk, they rang for matins early at Saint Sophia, the bells, but he heard the ringing in Kiev. And so this is where we come to our most accurate understanding of the werewolf in modern horror fiction, one that was proliferated in the many tales that occurred throughout the dawn of medieval Europe. Burchard of Worms of the Holy Roman Empire spoke of werewolves that roamed the countryside murdering folk in their sleep. Later, Liutprand of Cremona allegedly spread a rumour that Prince Bahan, the only son of King Simeon of Bulgaria, could use his debased magic to transform into a wolf at will. On the other hand, in Marie de France's poem Bisclaveret, written in the year 1200, she describes a nobleman, Bizonet who was cursed to transform into a wolf once every week. However, when his treacherous wife had stolen his clothing needed to restore his human form, he escaped the king's wolf hunt by imploring the king for mercy, and then as an act of penance, accompanied the king as his own werewolf bodyguard. Hmm. That's pretty damn interesting, right? Perhaps the Slavic traditions were rubbing off on them. You see, this is the beginning of the very clear duality now found of the werewolf in horror literature. On one hand, the Slavic reverence held for the lycan as depicted through the ancient pagan traditions of Iron Age Europe, one that is not a werewolf in the same sense, but a vlodglak, a wolf skin, which would later become associated with the concept of the revenant, the vampire, which is a hero to some and evil to others. But then on the other hand, we have the Germanic werewolf, or more importantly, the medieval werewolf werewolf, widely associated with the witchcraft panic beginning roughly around 1400 AD, a period of folklore history that hit its fever pitch in 16th century France and Germany. You see, here there were countless reports of werewolf attacks, hundreds of them in fact. Court trials clearly recorded in history, and in some fewer cases clearly found evidence against the accused lycan of both murder 
and cannibalism, which interestingly enough harkens back to the same fear that we found in the ancient Greek depictions of lycanthropy. Hey, I'm not saying that there's a direct correlation between the Holy Roman Empire and the medieval werewolf, but it's certainly interesting. And also, it is. Accusations of lycanthropy were frequent in the Valais witch trials of 1428. In the canton of Vaud, which borders the cantons of Freiburg and Bern, numerous child eating werewolves were reported through the year 1448. In 1598, in Anjou, a gang of werewolves were sighted roaming the rivers of the French lowlands. And in 1603, in Bordeaux, a teenage werewolf was sentenced to life imprisonment for the crimes of lycanthropy. Perhaps the most famous case of the medieval werewolf, though, came to the forefront with the blood thirsty tale of Peter Stump, a German farmer and alleged cannibalistic serial killer reported to have murdered and eaten over 18 victims, including 14 children and two pregnant women, after the devil himself had allegedly given him a werewolf girdle of black magic which bestowed upon him the all-consuming power and hunger of a wolf. Peter Stump, otherwise known as the werewolf of Bedburg, is perhaps the root form of what we now consider to be the classic werewolf of horror literature and cinema, but interestingly enough, it is one that focuses exclusively on the violent and bloodthirsty nature of a man who is caught physically or metaphorically transforming into a beast. Interestingly enough though, more often than not, the modern werewolf has often become a sort of hybrid of these two dualistic components of the ancient lycan, the conventions of which are just as much of a hodgepodge as its forebears were. Take for example the folklore depiction of silver being a repellent to a werewolf. You see, silver in folklore, particularly in Celtic folklore, is a very important trope, but as to where it came about in relation to lycanthropy, is anyone's guess. In 1640, as folklore tradition describes, the city of Griesfold in Germany was infested by a pack of werewolves, and as was written, a clever lad suggested that they gather all their silver buttons, goblets, belt buckles, and so forth, and then melt them down into bullets for their muskets and pistols. This time it worked, and they slaughtered the creatures and rid Griefswald of the lycanthropes. You see, in many ways, the fiction of the werewolf is a constant work in progress, constantly grabbing different components of folklore, superstition, mysticism, and religion, and piling it atop the wolf skin legend. In that regard, the werewolf is perhaps the most forward thinking horror convention ever known. In The White Wolf of the Harz Mountains, a short story appearing in The Phantom Ship written in 1839 by Frederick Marriott, the first ever demonic femme fatale was penned, one that this time transformed itself from woman into wolf. This trope would occur sparingly throughout gothic literature, but after the 1970s, particularly following Angela Carter's The Bloody Chamber and her short story The Company of Wolves written in 1979, the female lycanthrope changed the game once more, culminating in Ginger Snaps released in the year 2000, which is freaking awesome, and then again with 2011's Red Riding Hood, which isn't great, but it highlights my point, taking these themes and then applying the transformation of lycanthropy to that of sexuality and a transgressive discovery of the self, highlighting the liberation that comes from championing the natural form. And again here, the concept of the werewolf in culture has often been used to highlight a sort of social movement of sorts, be it one that is taboo, like the werewolf of medieval Europe, describing the fears of serial killers and cannibalistic monsters, or the satanic panic of witchcraft by the Holy Roman Empire, or on the other hand, one of a cultural advocacy and guardianship, like that of the Slavic werewolf, who harness the more primal urges of the human form to their advantage, often as a force for good in defense of their own tribe or people. You see, be it monster or man, so it seems that the duality of the werewolf has long lingered in the hearts of humanity for thousands of years, and will perhaps linger for thousands of years more. After all, aren't we just wild animals howling at the moon? Well there we have it folks, our most recent destination of this whistle stop tour of the Law Explored. What do you guys think? Which side of the werewolf duality would you fall upon? Let us know your thoughts down in the comment section below, as well as your general thoughts on this Law Explored series. Before we depart from today's video though, let's first take a quick look at some of your more creative comments from our last part of the Law Explored, the doppelganger. C.L. Lyman says, would a doppelganger be a supernatural selfie? Well, I think you might be right. And finally, Tammy Ruiz says, Doppelgangers and twins are so fascinating. Both my parents were twins and it runs on both sides of my family. There's also a whole island where almost everyone has identical twins. Probably best to avoid that as a vacation spot, Jack. Ah, wait. Your parents both have doubles. Double parents. What if they switch places? Oh no. Also, I'm going to ignore the fact that you said that there's an entire island where everyone has identical twins. Sorry twins, but just no. No. Well on that note, unfortunately that's all we've got time for in today's video, just stick around all the way until the end. If you're a fan of this video or just top 5 scary videos in general, then please be a dear and hit that thumbs up button, as well as that subscribe button, and I'll be seeing you in the next one. As per usual, I've been your horror host Jack Finch, you've been watching top 5 scary videos, and until next time, you take it easy.